or the best thing that I've ever done is just put it out there. This is the Bold Artist Podcast. You have answers and you're expressing them in your art. Your art is important and it needs to be seen. Welcome, and let's get started with today's episode. Welcome to another episode of the Bold Artist Podcast. Today, we are interviewing Anita McComas of Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada. Anita is a very accomplished wildlife artist who made the journey from realism into bold color painting. What would you do if you were displaying your art at a professional show and another artist came up to your booth and delivered you one of the most hurtful insults you could ever imagine? How would you react? We're gonna find out how Anita reacted because that exact scenario happened to her, believe it or not. Let's go over to our interview with Anita and hear the journey of her courage and determination into the world of bold color painting. Anita McComas, welcome to the Bold Artist Podcast. My co-host, Sharla Marskalk, and I, we so admire your loose, beautiful artwork and, of course, your use of bold color. Wow, <laughs> maybe, thank you. Yeah, maybe you can start out by telling us a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, I am a um, full-time artist, so I probably paint six days a week. I try not to do more than that, but I'm obsessed. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I've been painting for probably 30 years, um, wow. but only like in the colors that I'm painting now for about 14. So had a big shift at, at one point in my life and just kind of went away from traditional colors and started painting bold. So you started out traditional. Very traditional, yeah. I actually started out um, painting with a Rembrandt palette, which is all the traditional paints, like the dark burgundies. You know, the, there's no bright colors at all in my palette. Everything was mixed and everything was very natural. And then I kind of had this like life change and um, I, I became allergic to oils wow. and um, switched to acrylics. And then I found okay they don't mix the same so I started buying color and mm. it was like that's all she wrote like I was in love <laughs> wow what a great story yeah. and you also had mentioned to me that you had a pivotal moment at the Calgary Stampede Stampede yes <laughs> yes I did what's that I, um, story all about well you know what I um so when, when you go from painting very traditional, kind of very serious looking paintings to these really colorful pieces, um, especially in landscape, right? Like my, I started off mostly as a landscape painter. And so I got into the stampede in their artist showcase. Um, I had a booth. Um, I actually had a full booth. I was really lucky. The other person scheduled to be with me dropped out. So I had this full booth and I filled it with these massive canvases just full of color. And, you know, standing there, you get to meet all the other artists that are in the show. And I had this other BC artist come up to me, someone that I actually admired, a very realistic painter. And he started talking to me, you know, having conversations in my booth. And, and then one day, like the second or third day, he comes up and he stands in front of my booth and he goes, I know what's wrong. And I'm like, what's uh -oh. wrong? You know, like, what's wrong? Uh -oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, you need to dip these paintings in black like straight in my face wow. and I just looked at him like I I speechless did not know what to say to that like someone said to me I should dip all of my paintings in black <laughs> so you know I had a like I had this moment where I think it's a very female thing to just kind of laugh it off right mm -hmm. I don't know it's a me kind of thing mm -hmm. and um and then I really got angry mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. started actually painting even bolder. Wow. So that was kind of what happened to me. And I, and I actually sold paintings in the stampede. So it was kind of a, you know, it made mm -hmm. me feel good. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was, that was oh, it. That story pierces my heart. And I think <laughs> it's amazing to see where you're at today now, because if somebody walks up to you and says, you should paint, you should dip your paintings in black, it's such an incredible insult. And yet 
You turned it around, Anita, and oh. you turned it into an even further step of being bold. And that is remarkable. And Thanks. <laughs> thank you for sharing that here on the Bold Artist Podcast, because that is exactly what we want to do is empower artists to be bold. And if so, yeah. let's learn from that. If someone yes. delivers you the worst insult and telling you dip your paintings, in, I would never even think to say that to someone. I, I think you actually have to double down. right? <laughs> like that's, that's, I, I don't know. I, you know what? I don't think anything is a, it was never a deliberate reaction on my part, but mm. it's took me a little bit of time to kind of get mad you know mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I made it into this show like mm -hmm. obviously someone sees merit in my work why mm -hmm. are you telling me to dip my yes. paintings in black and if you're watching on YouTube you'll see that it, Anita is sitting in front of some of her wildlife pieces yeah. they're breathtaking they're bold they're so real the look in the eyes I'm, I'm seeing a wolf and a bear right now and the, yeah, the look I that move is the screen the, a little if staring you staring at me it's incredible and so Anita's sitting in her studio in front of her artwork and has come so far from the day that another artist told her to dip her work in black. So, yes. so Anita, congratulations on where you thank are you. today. And thank you for sharing your time with us here today to tell us more of your story. So, sure. so would you be able to, to share with us a little bit about your journey and how you specifically develop this very special connection that you have with wildlife? Oh, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, so, you know, I, I actually, as a child, um, was lucky enough to have horses. I came from a, a small family farm where we had a lot of different animals and I was always kind of the one that seemed to connect to the animals. But the irony is that when I actually started painting, um, I only painted people. Like mm -hmm. I, my first bit of painting was people never painted animals then I moved to landscape and it was kind of like, okay, I don't know why I'm not painting animals because I started off like painting horses as a kid or doing, you know, a lot of like horse pieces. Mm -hmm. And I had this um, moment that happened in the backyard of my house. It, my house is on a hill that's kind of tiered, the houses above and houses below. And I had taken my dogs outside one day and I hear this crashing above me, and above me was an empty lot, wooded. And I look up and I see this bear crashing right towards me. And I know I can't make it back to my house with my dogs, and the dogs are trying to go to the bear, and I'm trying to run to the house. <laughs> anyway, so this bear is just like weaving and crashing, and as it gets closer, it startles a deer, and the deer runs sideways and the bear turns and chases after the deer and that kind of moment which really like I mean I'm living in a neighborhood it wasn't you know it's not in the middle of nowhere it's an actual development and it kind of made me think about how the wildlife in our area have kind of integrated into our our man-made developments mm -hmm. you know lots of, I, I at one point I had 10 deer in my yard you know mm -hmm. and so I started painting um this series that had animals and and man kind of merging together right so I I, I often mention this piece called cityscapes that mm -hmm. I did where it had this bear very abstracted bear under a tree and behind it was kind of the city and the city would kind of transfer some some of the angles of the city buildings would kind of come into the into the treescape mm -hmm. and vice versa so the two were kind of integrating wow. so that was kind of a what started me painting animals again you wow. know and you never stopped after that I am obsessed <laughs> and how long ago was that transition that you you went from well from people landscapes and then to the animals how long and ago was the that animals. um I would say it's been probably I would say seven years maybe eight mm. I, I'm not even sure I can't mm -hmm. even tell you like <laughs> that's great it's such a part no, of no actually life. it had to be after 2015 because then I was mostly painting landscape so it must have been right after that right after the yes. black painting scene yes. I don't know. <laughs> so I guess with with that story in mind it would be fair to to share with artists who are starting out that it could take years to discover your favorite subject matter Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, I sometimes don't want to tell people how long I've painted because it then tells you my age. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, you know what? It's a journey. And it's like, honestly, 
I am so thankful for this journey. Like Mm -hmm. this is, I don't even know how to tell people how obsessed I can be with my art. Like not obsessed (laughs) in an unhealthy way, but just that I love it so much. Yes that I don't, don't want to stop painting. Like I, I, mm. I force myself to go mm. get lunch, you know, like I love, I love hearing that because I do know that, that at times artists wrestle with their art and they they can get frustrated and they, they can have difficulties learning and breaking barriers in their skill levels. And yeah. so sometimes, uh, I hear that, that there's ones that are feeling discouraged or, you know, I don't love my art and I'm struggling with my art. And then it's such a breath of fresh air that you say, I don't even know what time it is to get my lunch. I love it so much. And we need more of that. And that encouragement to know that it's okay to love your art. It's okay to, to, did you always feel that way, Anita? Did you always love it? Were there times that you were feeling frustrated? Oh, absolutely. And even now, like I have to say, I've kind of gotten, I've gotten into a habit of painting multiple paintings at a time. Mm. So I'll have a painting that I'm struggling with. Like I, I used to say anything that was still sitting around was something I was working on, <laughs> yes. but I actually physically will have two or three paintings on the go. Mm. And so when I get to a point with one where I'm very frustrated, like I have one I'm looking at right now, just past my camera that I just can't look at anymore. <laughs> yeah. But like it just, you just need to put it aside. Like mm-hmm. maybe that is your struggle and maybe that painting is going to go into the burn pile. Like mm-hmm. my, I actually don't have a burn pile. I have a shredded pile. Okay. I rip, I rip the canvas into shreds yeah. and I'm like, you are a loser. I'm done with you. <laughs> so there you go. There you go. Everyone listening. If this can happen to Anita McComas, it can happen to anyone, any level, any expertise, we can all have a shredded pile. And yes. yet obviously you don't shred it all because there's these amazing paintings behind you in your yeah, beautiful thanks. studio. And I would love to hear just a little bit about this studio that surrounds you because and and I also want to quickly add in here for our listeners and watchers that in case there's a slight echo or you hear that Anita's sound is a little different it's because she's in this big beautiful space and she brought internet in there just for the bold artist (laughs) podcast which we are so honored so thank you for doing that (laughs) by the way I when I reached out to Anita would you be a guest on the show she said Yes, but we got to set the date in such a time that I can get you internet and headphones and a microphone so that I can do the show. And so that is just so kind of you. Thank oh, you. Well, I have to thank you because actually it was on my bucket list, not my bucket list, my yes, to-do list, to-do which is, list. means it yes. has to be done soon. Yes. But it just, one of those things you just put off, oh, I'm busy. I can't do it. I got to call someone. You well, know. you're busy painting. You don't even know what yeah. time it is for lunch, right? Yes. <laughs> So tell us about this studio that you're in. Okay, so I I actually got really lucky and I um, made I, I bought a house right before the COVID pandemic. So you know I didn't have all of the problems a lot of people had getting work done. Um, but I bought a house in 1976 um, rancher that had a separate two car garage. So. And and really, I probably bought the house for the man cave. Like I wanted the studio. That was my, I was going to have the studio, right? I painted for years and years, usually in my my lower level. Um, And then I would do such damage to my walls because I I don't know if you see my painting, like that's 60 by 60, right? Wow. So like my paintings can be really big. Mm -hmm. And so like going up the stairs, you're always hitting something. So I really wanted a separate studio. So I have a, I actually have a two car garage. Mm -hmm. Um. It's, I've put heat in it. I just put internet in it. Wow. It's, it's far enough from the house that it didn't have its own, in, like I couldn't reach the internet to it. I had to put in some devices to kind of get mm-hmm. it here. But, um, but I just refinished the floors, you know, put in that epoxy floor, which is why I'm getting all the echo right now. Mm-hmm. And I, I haven't, put a hole in my walls yet <laughs> so all the paintings That's are okay. sitting on the floor <laughs> yeah do you have that moment where you're like it's all just so sacred and pristine right now yes. I don't want to put that first hole in because you know once you put the first hole in the first canvas is up there you're going to be painting on those walls <laughs> oh yes I know I know yeah. so I, I have already like my flooring I put in like a white epoxy like it's a white speckled epoxy because I nice. wanted like I wanted all of my colors to just jump so everything mm-hmm. is white mm-hmm. which sounds very medical 
radical, but it's not meant to. No, I love it. My studio is very white as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because then you really see your colors. You're not Mm -hmm. seeing them versus something else, right? Yeah. So anyway. And for me personally, it's also that I get distracted by other things. So if I have too much decor or too much other going on, it distracts (sighs) me from my my artwork so (laughs) absolutely I'm with you like honestly like if I didn't need stuff like you need stuff right Mm -hmm. I would have a perfectly empty space Mm -hmm. like but I have to have stuff yeah and then you transform it into what you need in that moment I like that approach yes so you have this beautiful space now and you're working big did it take you many years to transition into a large scale style painting or was that a natural for you so I guess it. I guess it became a natural for me. Um, I love to paint with very large brushes. So mm. my normal brush is about an inch and a half, two inch. So painting small and moving to smaller brushes to paint small, it just. I just tighten up in the painting and I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm trying always to kind of keep that loose feel, but I don't quite get it. So, I mean, I don't, I mean, for me, I paint, um, I don't paint perfect paintings. Like I'm looking for imperfection in a way. Mm -hmm. Like I want a little bit of a quirky feel to it. I want it to not feel like somebody's traced it. Like I, it, Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's like, a little more abstract, a little less abstract. It's, mm-hmm. I want those brush strokes to be really powerful. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm always looking for is how to create those brush strokes in an acrylic painting. Because if you are ever an oil painter and you put down a brush stroke, you can physically see it. Mm-hmm. But as an acrylic mm-hmm. painter, you put down a brush stroke. I don't care how thick your paint is, mm-hmm. it's going to kind of flatten, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. I guess for me, I want the illusion of the brush stroke. So mm-hmm. I really like large brushes <laughs> yes I I completely understand and you're achieving it I can see the brush strokes from here as I'm wow. looking over your shoulder it's so beautiful and so um can you tell us a little bit more about your approach to the canvas when you go to start a piece um there's so much that I'm wondering Anita <laughs> so okay I'm wondering if how you find your your specific subject I I know it's wildlife but that particular wolf that I see is it a photo that you took or a friend took? And then once do you work from a photo? And then once you do, how do you approach these magnificent colors, turning that reference into all this glorious, bold color that we see? What's that process look like? Okay. So I don't have um, a lot of opportunity to go play with wolves. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know so- if I would want to, although just to, before you start your story, I'd say I've met a bear twice. Well, probably a different bear twice. Um, I was living in Peachland at the time, which is not far from where you live. Yeah. And I met a bear face to face one day and I did oh. not enjoy it. I prefer no. the kind that I'm looking at over your shoulder when it's, Me too. When it's a beautiful uh, painting there. I, I love it and, yes. and deeply appreciate the bear. But when I'm face to face and I actually see myself in its eye reflection no. that's too much for me <laughs> me too I'm yeah. with you I so, am like the crazy friend that if we go on a hike I have bear spray and a knife mm-hmm. in my backpack and people oh, yes. are like we're still just on Knox Mountain I I'm know. like going fortunately the day I met the bear he or she was not interested in me at all <laughs> That's good. Yes. <laughs> well, that bear that actually ran at me, it's a, it's the true story is the bear was drunk on grapes. Ah. So a lot of the vineyards throw away their like end of season grapes and okay. the, the and they ferment on the ground. So the bear had been eating these piles of grapes and that's why he was kind of crazy tilty running down the hill. <laughs> so oh, you never know. <laughs> but back to your story. You're okay, going back to share to with story. us your approach to the canvas. <laughs> okay. So so basically I um I actually purchase images. So okay. I have um I try to buy from local artists or local photographers mm-hmm. um or I have a photographer that um I know from the states that travels up north to do excursions and she sells me the rights to paint some of her photos. I'll buy some rights from stock images Mm. um, because for me, I'm not painting realism. Mm -hmm. I'm painting maybe that pose. I'm painting parts of what I'm seeing. So I, 
but I need a reference. Like I need a reference. Mm -hmm. Um, With a reference, I can move a leg. I can still move Mm -hmm. the animal because I understand enough of the anatomy to do that. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I do need a reference, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I start with my reference image and generally I basically will do a little thumbnail. I'll try to figure out where I want to position the animal on the canvas, how close up I'm going to show it, how far away, whatever I'm going to do. Um, And, before before when there weren't some shortages on certain colors I would always paint um, a color on my canvas the entire thing would be nickel azo gold Mm, that's my go-to color color. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and lately because it's been a little scarce to get that color I've been kind of keeping it for painting some of my animals rather than using it as a background Mm -hmm. so um but but generally I kind of go right to it I don't um pre-draw like I draw Mm -hmm. with paint Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. I you know because I'm not looking for perfection I I don't um I don't really care how perfect my drawing is I want it to be realistic enough Mm -hmm. um so I will I will draw my painting my my piece whatever that bear or whatever that creature is on with paint and move it if I feel like it it's not quite right um but then I just start painting and Mm -hmm. I generally start with my darkest color first Mm -hmm. and then kind of build to light so Mm -hmm. that's the process for me um but and I do pre-plan in my mind my main colors that I'm going to be painting in Mm -hmm. so yeah (laughs) wonderful and so backing up again to the reference image what makes you choose that particular image what catches you when you're looking at an animal in a photo um sometimes it's the expression um sometimes it's the position Mm -hmm. it could be that it's a horizontal versus a vertical Mm. position of that animal that I can kind of stretch it into a certain canvas size that I've been wanting to use. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of like a lot of things that kind of come into my mind when I think of that or, Mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll take like uh, a couple images and combine them, you know? Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. so I'm reinventing the images in some ways. Right. So, um, because I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to keep them always fresh. I'm trying to really put an original spin on them and that's Mm -hmm. like I I, to me that's really important not to just paint what I see Mm -hmm. but to paint kind of what I'm feeling in that photo Mm -hmm. so I don't can't quite explain that but oh that's that's okay it it shows it shows and for anyone listening do check out the show notes see Anita's links and check out her website and portfolio because you will know when you see it that there is definitely a, a lot of emotion tied up into her process. A lot of emotion is put in there and I can see it in the animal's eyes, the colors, the brush strokes. It's really wonderful. Thanks for giving us a glimpse into your process there a little bit, Anita. And so are you generally bold by nature? You told us the story about that confrontation at the Calgary Stampede and and, uh, someone telling you an insult and, you know, dip your paintings in black and it stirred up an anger and uh, I would say it's a feistiness that came, (laughs) you know, a little feistiness that said, you know what, you're not going to tell me to dip my paintings in black and I am going to show the world that I'm made to do this and here you are (laughs) all these years later. Is that by nature, Anita, that you would be bold and brave with the brush with the decisions you've made? You know, I have to say no. Um, I was a extremely shy person Mm -hmm. as a young person. And like even through my university years, like I was not naturally bold. I was not naturally a risk taker. Like I'm, I have a very, um, I say this sometimes, which my daughter probably would hate if I say this, she hears it, but I could have been an accountant. Like I have a, I have a a more, sometimes a mathematical brain. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, my, my actual trade before I became a full-time artist was I was a buyer. Right. So, so like that, that's a very controlled kind of side. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so for me to get freer and freer with my paintings is something that kind of came out over time. It, Mm -hmm. It wasn't a natural like I've seen some people who are very naturally just bold. They just go for it. Mm-hmm. Mine was way longer of a process. Mm-hmm. Like it took me a lot mm-hmm. of time, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I have this theory in life, which I would like to share. Yes. Um, and I, and I tell this to my daughters. I mean, it doesn't just apply to art. It just applies. I think it's been a really key thing for me in my life. I really think the biggest or the best thing that I've ever done is just put it out there. Mm. So when, when I 
see something that's interesting and maybe I don't have the credentials for it, mm-hmm. I apply anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, if I, if I, if something kind of strikes my curiosity, I put my name forth. You know, if someone mm-hmm. asks me to do an interview, <laughs> I say yes. 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 So, yes, you say yes and I'll get the internet and headphones to do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, like that is really my best advice for artists that are kind of struggling with their art or I, start applying to things, apply mm-hmm. to shows, go mm-hmm. into juried shows. You mm-hmm. know what? I used to, I used to go into this particular organization. They'd have these jury call for art and I would always pick, I was very strategic, which was my math side. <laughs> and I'd pick a piece that I knew they would like, right? Mm-hmm. Like it was my very traditional kind of piece. And then I'd pick my piece that I would call my screw you piece. Well, I actually didn't use that word. I used a different word. And it was my screw you piece. And so I would submit these two very different pieces. One was, I'm sure I'm going to get in. And one was screw you, right? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of very rewarding for me when the screw you piece got in. (laughs) And so I thought, whoa. Yeah. So, yeah, I I mean, honestly, like if, if you painted something and you're not you're not sure people are going to like it. It doesn't matter. Mm. I, I say just, uh, just submit. I mean, just, mm-hmm. you know, put it out there. Like mm-hmm. you'll, you'll, you'll eventually kind of be, you'll eventually steer yourself mm-hmm. in a direction that will be authentically you. Mm-hmm. So. That is so profound. So if we were to create the quote, Anita McComas quote, it would say, <laughs> artists, put it out there. <laughs> What, do you want to do you want to alter that quote a little before I start? No, quoting? I like it. I like it. Put it okay. out there. Yeah, we're gonna put it out there and boldly put it out there. Which why is, not? Yes. <laughs> Which is, yeah, that is just such a breath of fresh air and a good, really good reminder, not just for artists, but for people in general, yeah. not to be afraid to take that step. Even if you, I, I like how you said, even if you didn't feel like you had the right credentials, because I think sometimes we're looking for permission or we're looking to be validated to say, you're qualified for this. And then we take the step and yeah. put ourselves out there. But you're you're encouraging us to do it the other way around saying absolutely before you feel qualified before anyone gives you permission put yourself out there and see what happens and what do you have to lose Mm -hmm. really Mm -hmm. right like you might you might have someone judge you and you're never going to see that person (laughs) i mean you have nothing to lose like put it out there yes now that is such good advice for the soul and for our just you know, practical ways of becoming an artist, but would you mind sharing a little tip on more of a skill matter, like something that would just be a real um, tip for those who are starting out in the skill building of being a painter? What would you share with us? Hmm. You know, I guess I would say keep it simple. Um, I know a lot of like I, I teach too, right? Mm. And I'll have students who might show up with a massive amount of paint colors. Mm. And, you know, yes, it's great to have all those options, but in a single painting, you don't need a lot of different colors. Mm. And I think that if you keep it simple, you're probably going to make some very powerful paintings. Mm. And so that would be my first advice, kind of start there. Start right. simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And then as far as practical techniques, what would you encourage people to be looking at? Their their color mixing, their composition, or like what would you say to dig into? I think composition is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some very basic rules that make for better paintings. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you have to take it to the nth degree like you do not have to learn about very advanced spirals or anything like that you just need to kind of have an idea of composition and I think you need to plan your paintings okay good. and that's really like that's what the point of the thumbnail is right let's talk about that because I think some uh, newcomers to painting they just want to start painting and they don't know that a huge aspect of being successful in a painting is the planning. (laughs) What does planning look like? We talked about reference photos. We talked about your, your stage of, you know, uh, 
drawing with the paint, you called it, which is a great way to, to describe that part of the process. But the planning, the planning of the colors and all of that, what does that mean to you? Well, I, you know, when, I, when I'm deciding on what to paint next, okay, I start with the image. Um, but, and I and like trans, start putting it on the canvas, that's another thing. But I know when I start painting, if that bear is going to be blue, Mm-hmm. I know if it's mm-hmm. going to be purple. Like I mm-hmm. have decided my main color. Okay. And you know, when I say keep it simple, like I I actually have a color wheel right across from me here. And I generally will use the the opposite on the color wheel as my secondary color, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if I'm doing a blue bear, there's a blue bear there. I don't know if you see I'm gonna move them. A blue bear there. Beautiful. Yeah, we, look, we, were, we could, were texting this morning. Charlotte and I were texting about your amazing bears. <laughs> well, if you we look at bears. his face, it's got these really bold strokes of orange, which is the complement ah, of blue. Yes. So yes. I, I deliberately mm-hmm. know that if I'm, you know, in my in this simple painting, because it's really got limited colors, mm-hmm. it's I'm using the complementary color as my accent, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I know that before I start painting. Mm-hmm. Like I know if my bear is going to be, I don't know if my, if my moose is going to be magenta, which he is. If you yes. see him, my there magenta he is. moose. Magenta moose. Yes. <laughs> like I'm going to use. I I would. I could have used a turquoisey color, but I wanted to kind of put something in the green tones, right? Mm-hmm. So you know, I will shift a little bit, but I will generally kind of be aware of the colors on the color wheel and mm-hmm. look at putting complements um, on the same painting Mm -hmm. and that's such a crucial part of the planning is just planning out those colors accordingly which is really such good tips so thank you for that just the skill of keeping it simple making sure to plan and i love what you said about putting it out there put it out there put it out there (laughs) that's the tip (laughs) of the day yes i had i had a little necklace at one point that just said just do it (laughs) and that was my that was my mantra just do it just do it and (laughs) just apply for that (laughs) just put your name out there just you know yes yes okay here's a surprise question what's Uh -uh. currently on your palette? well you said you work on like three or four at once but what's what's going on in, in anita's painting world today so i actually just finished so I didn't paint today I was actually varnishing this morning okay. because I was you know I had to put on a nicer sweater <laughs> isn't that funny I I don't do anything else on podcast days either <laughs> I know you know like you have to take the shower you I have know. to do the hair <laughs> yeah. and yeah. so varnish would you know it's not going to show up if it's on my face yes. <laughs> but um but no I'm I'm actually right now I have um I have a show like a solo show coming up in Kelowna in um on November 9th ninth at Tut mm-hmm. Art Gallery. Nice. So I'm I have a uh, I don't know 20 some paintings that are kind of in various stages of ready for them. Mm-hmm. And then I have another shipment I'm sending out to another gallery. So I'm varnishing those. Yeah. So yeah, that's just kind of, you know, it's you caught me at a day where I actually have like lots of stuff happening in my in my studio. Wonderful. So, well, yeah. Thank you for sharing today with us. Thank really you for inviting me. Yes, we really appreciate having you on the show.